We are here, talk wave. And we're in quarantine still in California. I have not surfed in like 30 days. We have a fantastic guest today. I'm gonna ask to go live with him now. Wayne Rabbit Bartholomew, our 1978 world surfing champ. We're waiting for Rabbit now, connecting. Rab? Alex, how are you? <laughs> Dude, you got a background too. Yeah, yeah, I've got, got my new Navy in there. <laughs> uh, I yeah, love it. You, you, you got a couple of Al Merricks back there, have you? Yeah, I got some of my boards. One of my chief complaints was that I don't have a nice enough background for people to look at. And yeah, well, that's cool. I thought I'd better put one in too. <laughs> is that is that is that the latest model? That's your model, right? Yeah, that's my model. It's one of the ones Nev's doing. It's a is um you know, we've got about three or four in the model and that's that's a little small wave small wave board. It's kind of like a bit of a fish design and a uh, bit wider. You know, a bit of nice, nice bit of leash reach for the old bloke. <laughs> I love it. You know, uh, some of my younger, older friends, they've all gone on to the round nose rabbit. And to see that you're still rocking the pointed nose. Yeah, that's well, that's really right. And all my, yeah, well, that's what I work with Nev on. Like, just that we wanted a, a board that's, you know, got everything. You know, I call them. We, we they're called never surrender it's a never surrender model in actual fact we i call them surfboards for the challenged <laughs> <laughs> yeah challenge through a whole range of things you know whether you're getting old or overweight or you don't surf much or you just you know i mean you work too much i mean not too much of that going on at the moment but just a lot of people like and i that don't want to sort of surrender and get a mini mal or you know something like that and so it's still, it's all there, but it's got this, still got a high performance bottom rocker, you know, still it's super fast and, and, uh, you know, I love them. Never surrender. I love it. So it's obvious that the surf stoke is still as passionate as ever. How many years is it now, Rab? Oh, oh, well, I've been surfing for uh, 55 years now. So yeah, so good. But I mean, it, it, there's been a little bit of a rekindling because I've had a bit of a, I had a little bit of a rough patch there where um, I, uh, I had a, I had a knee injury, mm -hmm. and that went from a knee injury. Then a, a few months, I didn't get the surgery. It was a meniscus tear, and then I had an unstable kneecap, um, and it just sort of, it just continually degenerated a little bit, and and I was out of the water for a long time. So I mean, I was basically out of the water for nearly two years. Oh. Um, and I've I've only in the last month got back into surfing, so it's fantastic. I mean, it's it's like a re reawakening again. It's it's so good. I mean, I I work on on things. I mean, I, I was only down on my surf fitness, but I was going to gym and I was doing things to keep strong in my shoulders and and all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, man. I mean, and I've got to tell you, Alex. I mean, the gnarliest thing was the last six months of it became a mental thing. Like uh, it was like I had writer's block. Yeah. Um, you know, the, like the, the confidence was gone. I didn't want to go over the handlebars in front of my kids. Um, <laughs> I could have written a book, 50, you know, fix the excuses why not to surf, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was going on shore. There's been blue bottles, Portuguese men of war sighted in the area. I mean, I, and I realized, I said, man, you've got to give yourself an uppercut. Like, it, it's like, this is just bullshit, you know, like, <laughs> get back out there. So we finally, we've got a cyclone swell. Um, and that kicked me into gear, and um, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm talking like it was six feet, blue walls, not a drop of water out of place, offshore, sunny. I mean, come on, where's your excuse, right? <laughs> and I and I went out there, and I, I had I caught one big blue wave, at uh, on the superbank in Greenmount, and I came in about three hours later, and I just went, "You idiot, what have you been doing? <laughs> All I had to do was get up." <laughs> I think maybe you and I can relate to self-sabotage then because I've been through the injuries before and yeah. it takes me mentally to a very dark place that I go in and out of anyways, but it's a reminder of how precious surfing is and what it truly means to professional surfers, but what it means to you and your daily mental health. And when it's taken away, it's very easy. We have to face ourselves again. I've done so much running with my surfing. You know, I can jump on a board, I can go surf, and I can run away from that problem. 
and yes, it always makes it better. I find clarity when I surf, I find the moment, all of these things, but uh, it's really hard when it's taken away. And, you know, right now in Los Angeles, we're going through this COVID experience and all of our beaches are closed. So I've been living vicariously through Australia, which you guys are doing such a great job and still being able to surf. And I'm stoked to hear that you're getting amongst it. Yeah, well, we looked, it was amazing, really. We had this cyclone Gretel, it was about a month ago. It was about five weeks ago. And, um, and that was, it was, look, on a personal note, it was, it was really good for me. And, I, and since then, I've been surfing every day, which is really good to be surfing with my kids. But, but also, uh, you know, Alex, we were kind of lucky because if that cyclone swell had come a few weeks later, um, I really think we would have been, they would have shut the beaches down. I mean, you know, I mean, no one was behaving themselves, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just too perfect. And, um, and there's, a, you know, there's a lot of surfers around here. And I mean, even though I do believe, uh, I, I firmly believe that, you know, the place of zero to low to none transmission is the ocean. I mean, seriously, you know, I mean, we should be able to go on the ocean. And, and, and one of the things I spoke to the mayor about was like the mental health side of um you know while while everyone is doing it tough and like you know, I mean, you know the economy's um trashed i mean people have lost their jobs we're all everyone's doing it tough i mean just being able to go in the ocean i, I mean I, I said to him let, let us just surf and then go home but it, but having said that you know we, we we still rely on some self-regulation that you know we're going to behave ourselves and and not abuse the system and my god if it's a perfect day of surf it's hard to you know because if if, if, if you see 100 people on the beach, well, there's 10,000 people go, well, I want to be there too. You know, so it's, it's gnarly. I mean, um, I know in different parts of the world, um, you know, and I, I feel for you guys in, in, in California and, and the US and throughout, you, you know, Europe, you know, they haven't been able to go on the surf. And I, I, I really feel for you guys. I mean, it's that mental health side of being able to go on the ocean is, is, is major. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a big part of not just healing, but it's a big part of just sort of your self, you know, esteem, you know, and just feeling good. And it's true. I mean, who, who when you come out of a surf, whether you're body surfing or, or going for a swim or, or riding a surfboard or, you know, even on a goat boat, anything, when you come out of the ocean, <laughs> who doesn't feel terrific? Yeah. You know, so you're, you're missing that, man. I, I feel for you. Uh, well, well, thank you. And uh, doing these interviews has been a way to, try to keep my brain moving, but also form some entertainment for everybody out there that is stuck at home. And, you know, Rabbit, getting to the beginning of your story and speaking about mental health, you were faced with adversity at a very young age. Um, and we're going to get into it if you don't mind, but I know that you came from having a separation from your parents at a young age. And then, you know, at times being the bread maker to support your family and you found surfing throughout that entire thing. What was that like? Because there's many kids that go through it that don't talk about it. And I was- yeah, no, no, well, that's true. I mean, it's oh, look, it's so not unique to come from a broken family. I mean, n now it's nearly the norm. Obviously back in the mid 1960s, it, it wasn't the norm. Um, you know, you, 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 we were coming through the 1950s. It was basically like Pleasantsville, you know, where you, you stuck it out. Everyone it looked all great with a nice house and the white picket fence. But behind there, there were some terrible marriages going on. Uh, sure. but, and, and, you know, my mum bailed, you know, like <laughs> she did it. And she took us kids down the beach. We lived right on the beach. We had no money. I mean, even though it was super tough, I mean, it was still amazing because all roads, it, it, it got me to the surf, you know. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there was it was back in the day when there was no um, no welfare, no no child maintenance, no no nothing, you know. And my, my mum had to just sort of try to pull it off, and we often had no food, and, and it was we were we were living in poverty, you know, and like on the beach in paradise, living in poverty. And yeah, I was a breadwinner, and and I, um, you know, as I put it in my book, you know, I I, I used to steal from the tourists and bring home twenty dollars from my mum and. Um, put it on the table and everything. She was so desperate, like she never questioned where it came from, you know, and, but like, you know, my, my life of crime finished at 12, you know, I mean, you know, I mean it was all over by 12. I'd, I'd you know, I'd, I'd gone straight by 12. All my, all my rackets were over, you know. <laughs> at that, at that time, had you found surfing as an outlet? Is that when it began for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I used to just uh, be down at, at Rainbow Bay and Kira. Um, you know, I didn't have a surfboard. Um, 
you know, my father had actually taken me into Joe Larkin's surfboard factory about three years before, and I was looking at this amazing board. It was a shorter board at the time. It was probably about seven foot six. It was a little board and had this incredible floral design, and I really wanted it. And this, this is so long ago that we didn't even have dollars. It was, it was, it was, the board was 40 pounds, wow. and, um, and it was just a bit too much. I left there, and it took me another four years to get a surfboard. But um, I used to just bum surfboards. You know, when I, mean, I worked in a hire surfboard hire a Kira and, and, and a Greenmount. I used to hire out surfboards. And then basically what I realized without leg grows, as soon as guys fell off their boards on the outside, you know, with the current and that, it would take them a while to get their board. And I just, I just grabbed the board, go surf some waves. And, <laughs> and then by the time they came back, I'd, I'd, I'd have the board ready for them. Hey, man, I got your board, you know. That's I so saved, cool. I saved it from going on the rocks. <laughs> And I did that for years, you know. I got pretty, and then there was that swing, you know, the swing that's in free ride. I, I rode yeah. that for a couple. I rode that for a couple of years, you know. I, I got pretty good at surfing on that thing. Can you explain how Cure was for? Well, it was already formed, you know. It's changed now, but the uniqueness of how the sand is pushed around, and and that in a sense is controlled by. Is it your city council? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, it, it's like. Um, we live in a, a really modified area. Like, I mean, once you start building structures like groins and, and things and, and jetties and that, it, it affects the sand flow. It's going to affect the sand flow. It's going to have a knock-on effect. Our sand goes from south to north. It's going to have a knock-on effect points north. So once you start building things and start modifying the coastline, you've got to keep doing it. And, um, and that's what happened here. And over a period of 30 years, the sand um, got deflected and instead of nourishing and coming around and, 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 and to our point breaks and our beaches, we had a lot of erosion and the sand was getting caught and it got caught out on the Tweed Bar, which is just behind Duran Bar. And basically there was 30 years of sand stuck out there. And, and because it was right on the border, it had to be a deed between the Queensland government and the New South Wales government. New South Wales wanted a navigable entrance to the Tweed Bar and Queensland was the recipient of all the sand. And all we did, me and Bruce Lee from Snapper Rocks, we just went to the first meeting and we caused such a ruckus that they said, well, you guys better become advis advisories. And, um, and we went, well, we think the sand works this way. And, but we, they had to find an expert. Um, you know, I introduced the two words wave quality to the, to the whole project. They had to find an expert in wave quality I said, I know one. No. <laughs> I, and, um, <laughs> Me. <laughs> but I didn't have the letters behind the name. So, and they found this gentleman. And of all, of all people, of course, he was Hawaiian. And he came from Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San yes. Diego. Sure. He, he, they flew him out here. And I took him on a tour. And I said, basically, this is how I think it works. And, and we, we collaborated over, you know, over a whole day. He went back and, and they built the thing and it's basically exactly, <laughs> and the sand basically, you know, they, they pump it to, from over the, the other side of Duran Bar down to Froggy Beach and it, and it comes around snapper like a little, like a heart valve. So once it starts, it starts moving by itself, it's like a little heart valve. Every, every tide, every wave pumps the sand around, then it grooms the banks. And, and that's what, I mean, this place, oh, my, my equation on the whole place is, Surf plus sand equals success. You know, I mean, <laughs> they're sand bottom point breaks. I mean, why not try and groom them, you know? How, how was it growing up as a kid? I mean, did you learn how to surf at Kira? Because during your era, for everybody out there, you know, starting 60s, moving into the 70s, um, Kira was at one point considered the greatest wave in the world. Yeah. And that was your home break. I come from Los Angeles. It's crappy beach breaks. We don't have that rabbit. <laughs> and, it, oh, yeah, I mean, a, uh, and the tube, I mean, you have, a, it, it's a double black diamond. It's crazy to grow up in a wave like that. Yeah, it is like, I actually began surfing at Snapper Rocks in Rainbow Bay. And then in 1968, my mum moved to Kira. And that was fortuitous. Um, but you've got to remember, it was still the longboard era. You know, um, Wayne and Robbie Dean had made me a little board in, 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 the, in the summer of 67, and it was this in the it, it this is a time when the boards had gone from nine six to eight foot. Well, they built me a six foot eight, and I, I mean, I, I, a mate of mine used to race me home from school because he said that's not a surfboard rabbit, that's a kneeboard, and he was a kneeboarder. But anyway, we moved to Kira, 
And how's this, Alex? My first weekend we were there. I was surfing the, the, the going to school, surfing the shore breaks during the week. On the first Saturday morning, I got up and there was this stiff, beautiful offshore wind. It was crisp. I felt something in the air. And as I walked down the beach towards Kira Point, all I could see, I'll, I'll never forget the sight. It, it looked like whales on their side because they kept spitting. The waves, like, it was like corduroy with all I saw was spit, 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 spit. It was unbelievable. But, but it was the longboard era and, and the longboards couldn't tube ride. And so I stood in the shed on this morning in 1968 and all I saw was this super strong offshore wind. And as the guys came to the super full-on dredging below sea level Kira section, they'd flick out. <laughs> and, the, and the boards, all I remember that day was waves spitting and boards flying in the air. No way. <laughs> yeah, that's my vision because the boards are very colourful back there. You know, there were Union Jacks and all colours and these boards just on their side flipping in the air. And so, you know, then over at the Joe Larkin factory, things started to change. There were some great shapers came in the area, like Terry Fitzgerald came up and spent us some time. Gordon Merchant uh, was a really good shaper. When Gordon actually did, and then they were cutting through a few more, a couple of years later, but when Gordon actually did the tucked under edge um, on a surfboard, because the, the shortboard revolution, when they, the first lot of surf shortboards were just rotten shortboards, you know, like they were like the longboards, but just shorter. PT and I used to go, well, the only good thing about these things is you can get hang five quicker but, <laughs> <laughs> at Greenmount. But um, when Gordon did the tucked under edge, combined with, you know, what was coming out of Hawaii, you know, I mean, Dick Brewer has got a lot to answer for. I mean, that guy just made the most amazing surfboards. And see, a wave like Kira is, is, such, is quite a demanding wave. It's a bit like Hawaii, you know, that first entry point. You, it's a free fall and then it's a square bottom, like back to a pipe, you know. And, um, and, and so suddenly we we're getting boards that you could actually ride behind the barrel, you know, and ride in the barrel of Kira. So in the guys I grew up with, like Michael Peterson, Peter Townend and Wayne Dean and were you know very 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 good surfers and uh we, we were suddenly going from you know this these long boards and it happened really really quickly cutting down boards underneath michael pittens house and coming out riding the shore boards and then over the joe larkin factory all these innovations uh and then you know with with the influence of guys having gone to hawaii peter Jordan and coming back with boards like that influenced by dick brewer reno abelira um, you know, incredible Jerry Lopez, incredible uh, what was happening in Hawaii, and then putting that into Kira. Suddenly, by 1971, we were getting 10 second barrels. Oh, yeah, can't... so that, that was that was a pretty cool thing to to be part of, you know. And so the addiction must have been alive and well, because for me, what's outlasted anything is wanting to get barreled and to grow yeah. up with something like that at a and sand is different than reef. There's something unique and special about a sand bottom, dredging brown, dark into blue. It's just so dynamic. Yeah. Was that your whole life, or did you did there come to a point where you're like, I want to surf every day, but this Kira wave is what means the most to me? Well, I, I got to tell you, Alex, like my world was pretty small back then. You know, I mean, my world was you know, Kira to Diva, you know, maybe a trip up to Burley Heads if I was lucky, you know, if someone gave me a ride. And and I I honestly, I used to walk around Kira Point to get the school bus. Wow. And I honestly thought, I said, there must be like 50 or 100 of these Kiras. You know, I mean, I thought that every headland down the coast, there was a Kira. I, I mean, I really actually didn't realise that, you know, I lived at this place that, you know, eventually a lot of other waves would be measured by um, but yeah, it became my whole, I mean, honestly, I mean, there was a school just above Kira and the, the Peterson brothers went to that school and I'd walk around Kira Point on a Monday morning, uh, back in the day where, you know, there was no uh, dole, there was no, uh, Centrelink unemployment benefits. I mean, you either, you either went to school, you did an apprenticeship or you went to university or something. And during the week, there was no one surfing. There was absolutely no, I'd walk around Kira Point City cylinders on the way to school and go, yeah, right, I'm really getting on that school bus, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, at that point, there was no such thing as professional surfing. No. And so was there, was there a moment in time as a teenager where you had to go to an apprenticeship or maybe go to university and you said, you know, I have an idea. I want to make money at this. I, I'm going for it. 
Well, you know, I, 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 by nineteen seventy one, I was going to uh, Miami High School, and 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 um, the the principal, I, I basically talked him into having surfing as a, a sport, which was a, a big, big gamble for an an adult. You know, surfers were the dregs of society. You know, with the dropouts, the druggies, like they just, you know, lock up your daughters, and like it, it was like, <laughs> the, you know, the original rebels, right? And um, uh, it was very appealing, uh, which made it even more appealing for a young guy. But I mean, I had I, in my I call it my Forrest Gump era, where my we lived about four miles from the school, and I'd walk to school in the morning and walk home in the afternoon. And I, I had this constant daydream every single day. I had this daydream, and it was about professional surfing. It was about going to Grand Prix events around the world. It was winning titles. It was having a world rankings. It was ratings. And at the end of it, I, I did really, you know, obviously in my dream, I did well. The only thing I don't recall in, in my dream was Mark Richards doing so well in my dream, you know. <laughs> but, but still. Love it. Yeah. He dropped in on me. But um, but this was really, really, every single day I had the same dream. It was unbelievable. And then across the road from Miami High School was a Honesty Surfboards. And the word filtered over that Paul Nielsen, a great Australian surfer, Paul Nielsen, was being paid twenty dollars a week to surf. <laughs> and this was like a, you know, this was a Blues Brothers moment for me. This was a sign from God that this my dream had legs. And uh, and I mean, he wasn't paid to go in contests; he was paid to surf. And I went, this is incredible. I mean, this is we're the original bums of all times, and you know, someone thinks that we should get paid to surf. <laughs> you know, the, so this was this is how. I mean, the the biggest critics of my dream were my fellow surfers. Mm. You know, like I mean, this is at a time when like, you got to remember, like we're we're coming out of the whole psychedelic era, we're coming through the whole hippie era. Where I mean, you know, the Morning of the Earth was, um, you know, five summer stories, all these amazing surf movies with living in the country and. You know, I mean, I, I was with them. I, I had one foot in that camp too. I was so prepared to go and live in a treehouse. But, you know, this this professional surfing thing was in my head, you know, and it was a means to an end, you know. And then when we heard about the surf, there were some uh, professional surf events in Hawaii. It was like, wow, you know, like it was so, so cool. This dream actually lives, you know. And it was, it, I mean, seriously, no one believed me. You know, I mean, I, I went to a bank. I walked into the bank. I put on my best shirt and my best pair of thongs and, uh, and I walked in there and I said, I sat down, I said, sir, I, you know, I need to, I'm going to start a business. Uh, I need to borrow a thousand dollars. And he looked at me, he said, well, you look like an, you know, a very industrious young man, enterprising. He said, what would be the nature of your business? And I said, I'm going to be a professional surfer. I need a thousand dollars to go to Hawaii. And it was just like this look I used to get. It was like, you know, the, you know, it, it, the symptoms out get out now, you know, <laughs> like the look of scorn, right, from every adult, you know, of, of, you know, basically of my, my father's generation, just, you know, just hated everything we stood for. <laughs> and so you, you were constantly having to prove yourself, you know, or, or explain why, at what age did, I think, I think that you're one of the greatest competitors of all time within you know seeing all that you've accomplished there is a very amazing competitive aspect to you um and also drive to 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 succeed and and we'll get further into that as it goes but man you you did you accomplished i think every goal or not everyone but major ones that you set yeah. you know some people talk about and other people do how well, how I mean, is that instilled in you well, you know, the thing is, Alex, we, we came through, uh, when we came through, we, we came through a six-man heat system. I mean, just the nature of that was a, a pretty a, a pretty dog-eat-dog -dog sort of environment, six-man heats, you know. And then I grew up with a guy called Michael Peterson and PT, but Michael Peterson was just an animal, you know. I mean, he was just, he was the king of psych. I mean, we're talking about Ali versus Fraser here. I mean, we, you know, he would just psych you out on the beach before you even made a move. I learned everything of him. And... um you know, he was he was such a competitive animal. I mean, there was one. I was down with my son one day at Rambo with this with this lockdown where they shut all the parks, all the beach parks, and we were walking down there one day. And I said, I said, Jack, I said, 
welcome to 1971, man. This is what it looked like. I'd be down at the depot at 6.30 in the morning waiting for someone to surf because it looked a bit sharky out there with perfect A-frames in the middle of the beach. And the only guy I'd turn up would be Michael Peterson. There'd only be two of us on the beach. And he'd still fade me on my first wave. <laughs> 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 That's how competitive he was. Yeah. I mean, we all came through this competitive, you know, Mark Richards. Mark Richards, he might be as nice as pie, but he's a super competitive animal, you know. And Sean Thompson and all those guys, Michael Ho, I mean, really that era, we were all full on, right? And we came through six man heats into man on man. I mean, man on man was such a luxury by 1977. Um, you know, surfing man on man at Burley in the Stubbies Classic was such a luxury compared to these six man heats. So, I mean, it's kind of bullshit that people go, oh, you know, we, we just used to hassle each other and all that. It was, it was, there was, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of like, you know, strategy involved. Uh, there was a lot of psyching out involved. <laughs> it's just how it was, you know. Honestly, it attracts me. Um, I, you know, for me personally, I don't think I ever gave myself credit as a good surfer. But when I put a jersey on, I wanted to win. And I would do so by playing the rules and playing all of them. Because that was the difference between a free surfer and a competitive surfer. You showed up to win. And there were some people that really didn't take a liking to that. But I was also yeah. the person that we went back to the beach. I wanted to say good job. And some guys, you know, their response was, dude, F you. I I'm going to kill you right now. And I'm like, well, yeah. I'm just playing by the rules. And there's different personalities involved. But how you guys started professional surfing, and you're starting to name the cast of characters that went over to Hawaii, um, it was dog eat dog. It was for real. It wasn't for, you know, six-figure contracts and coaches no. and managers and your parents getting to travel with you and basically your hand being held through troubling times as a teenager, but also trying to succeed in what you believed in being a world champion. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, you know, we, we had to kind of make it up as we went. I mean, it, I always think we kind of willed it into existence. You know, uh, we, we, we wanted it so bad. We wanted it to happen. Like, I mean, my dream was, and this is why I was so full on, my dream, I was in, I was one of the center figures in my dream. My dream wasn't just for Kelly Slater. You know, it was like for me, <laughs> it was for us. <laughs> um, I remember this amazing conversation I had with Gordon Merchant, you know, it was 1972. We'd just come in from the most perfect day at Kira. It's the end of the season. And, and, I, and, and I said, to, and Gordon goes, look, man, what are you going to do next year? You know, you, you know, you're in your last year of high school. What are, what are you going to do? And I looked at you and went, what do you mean, man? I'm going to win. I'm going to go around the world and I'm going to win. I'm going to win tournaments all over the world and I'm going to be a pro surfer. And he looked at me and went, you know what? It's not going to happen in your time. And, and, wow. and I said, well, you know, what are you going to do, man? And he went, oh, because he's about 12 years old. And he said, oh, you know, I'm going to make these board shorts, you know. This is 1972. Bill Long started in 73. So we were both right, you know give or take a half a billion dollars. We were both right. And we both did what we said we were going to do, you know. Um, and we willed it into existence. And that's why we were so uh, kind of nearly over-exuberant and, and we talked it up. I mean, I, I remember reading this book about about these great tennis players, Rod, Rod Laver. Oh, there you go. It's okay. These things happen. Okay. Um, Rod Laver, you know, Ken Rose, all these great tennis players, and, and I used to think they were multimillionaires and, and they, they, they used to call themselves the tennis bums and they'd go around the world and they'd just talk it up. They'd talk up their sport. This is in the 1950s. Well, we, Sean Thompson and Mark Richards, Peter Tan and Ian Kans, you know, Mark Warren, we all did, Mike Thompson, that's what we did. We talked up our sport as though it was the greatest thing of all times. And meanwhile, we were like, like scunging money to get to the next event in another country. Like, you, you know, if you didn't win enough money, you mightn't get to the next event. <laughs> it was all just a means to an end. So we could basically win some more money so we could stay in Hawaii for another month, you know, <laughs> and surf. What, what did Hawaii mean to you, Rabbit? Uh, well, it was just, a, it was the ultimate proving ground. And, you know, I first went there in 1972 with Michael Peterson and, um, you know, it was just such an eye opener. You know, we, 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 I got paddled out at Sunset Beach on a 12 foot day by Al Chapman. You know, I got my first big wave at Sunset Beach. You know, all the, 
the best surfers in the world were out there. You know, Eddie and Clyde O'Cowan, Barry Kanofuni and Jeff Hackman, James Jones, Reno Abalera, Sam Hawke, Al Chapman, Tiger Spear. I mean, really, it was just to be out there amongst those, they were like gods, really, was so special. Then we came in from that surf and uh, we were staying in the A-frames at Rocky Point. And Al Chapman came down and said, look, man, let's come down to come down to Pipeline, you know. I was going, oh, my God, are you serious? You know, and we went down to Pipeline and, and like, Jerry Lopez was out there, Tom Stone. Uh, Al Chapman was doing the hooded owl ornament, you know. Uh, he, he was, like, off his head, you know. It was, it was so unreal. It was such an impact on me. But the biggest impact on me was seeing the movie Five Summer Stories and, um, you know, Jerry Lopez at Pipeline with the incredible style and getting spat out of barrels. But then at the end of the movie was this sequence called Big Monday and it was Al Chapman, Sam Hawke, James Jones surfing like 15, eight, 15 to 80 foot pipe on, on Big Monday. I remember when I walked out of the, mo- the theatre in Coolangatta and this is before I'd even been to Hawaii, I just, something had happened to me. Like I just went, I don't know how this skinny little kid from Kilangata is going to do this, but I am going to do that. And, and it just became a lifelong, like just like an obsession with me, um, big pipe. And, um, you know, it was like to be able to actually live that and, and, and then one day do that, you know, uh, it, it took a lot of, a lot of willpower and a lot of, you know, I didn't have big muscles, but I had a big heart, you know, so I, you know, Australians are pretty courageous people. We go for it, you know, and um, we ha- I had a good crack at it. So, and I'm going to use this to segue past it, but where did you get your nickname Rabbit from? Oh, see, you see, now we go all the way back to, see, and then here's the thing, Alex, I, I've, I've told stories about, you know, I got up from playing pinball. I've got up from being a good soccer player. You know, I've got babies all around the world. They're all, they're all, <laughs> they're all, every one of those is a big fat lie, right? They're okay. all a lie. So here's the deal. For the first time ever, I'm going to tell the truth. And because it's just you and me talking, right? Sure. <laughs> so back in the day when, you know, uh, we already spoke about the days, the bad old days. And I said, look, I'd already gone straight by 12. Well, at 11, I, had a, I, had a, I really did have a racket going, right? Like, I, you know, Kulangat had 200 pinball machines and 60 pool tables. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, I used to try to get down to this. I had my favourite pinball machine. It happened to be Peter Townend's favourite pinball machine too. And I'd race down past the trampolines where I would come around the corner to little Alfie's uh, den and there'd be PT on Seabiscuit. And I'd be so bummed, you know, he'd beat me to it, right? And I had to run all the way over the other side of town to, because there was only another sea biscuit on the other side of town of Funland. And, you know, you wonder why Australians got gambling habits. But anyway, finally, what happened was that I got so good at pinball and so good at pool. I used to, there was an older guy from Kira, the best surfer Kira, Harry Hacker Allen. We used to hustle pool on Saturday mornings and make money off the tourists shooting pool. We never were beaten. Then I used to go over to this place, Gill's Cafe, right next to Twins Police Station. And there was the pinball machines. There was the trampolines that I worked on. There was the pool tables. And there was these two gambling machines called belly machines. They were pinball machines without flippers. I got so good at these things. Michael Peterson was managing this place. Her mu- <laughs> mum. No, no, his mum, Joan. I got so good at these things. You had to get the balls in a hole and you could win money. The guys used to come in on a Saturday morning with their pay packet and actually get me to win money for them, and I'd get a sling. I'd get 10 and 10 to 20 percent sling, which is really good money. Right? If I if I made them eight dollars or ten dollars, I'd get like two bucks, you know. So I was making really really good money for a kid, and and I I got to the point where I had both machines. Had, there's no flippers. You can really shake a pinball machine, but these things you can't shake them much because they'll they'll tilt, you know, and you'll lose all the money for everyone, everyone, and they'll want to beat you up. So then I used to actually play two machines at once on a Saturday morning, and it took a certain hopping action between the machines. And seriously, one guy one day looked at me and just went, you're, you're a rabbit. No way. That's why I can't tell the story to kids, because it's a gambling story, you know? Like, <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly... <laughs> I said, it, I, 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 it's I really your story. Am. It's your story. It, it's great to hear the honesty and truth. And I think as you go on, you're apt to now tell it. And 
that's awesome. I would have never in a million years. I thought it was from like a soccer game or something. Nah, well, it was this, it was these two gambling machines, and the thing is, by twelve, the place had been busted. And, you know, I mean, obviously, it, it wasn't illegal gambling. It was just illegal for an eleven-year-old to be gambling. <laughs> Managed by Michael <laughs> Peterson's mom. Yeah, she was the manager of the place. Sure. <laughs> so it was all it was it was all in the family. <laughs> so so we have Rabbit the nickname, which I see where bugs can come from there. Yeah. The reason I wanted to segue into that is we move into Muhammad Bugs mm. and really get into the to, to a crazy era of you guys traveling to Hawaii and, and coming back to that part of living your dream and now doing it over at the world center stage. But you did it. You did it with personality and you did it with, uh, gosh, no apologies, it seemed like. Well, everyone had personalities, you know, I mean, I mean, like all the guys I looked up to, everyone had their own aura and their own personality, you know, I mean, it was, it was a time when individuals were just, out, you know, it was an outrageous time. I mean, the, the North Shore in the 70s was an out, it was, out, it, was that, that's, it was just wild. It was just, it was the Wild West. Anything went and it was amazing. And look, the whole thing with busting out the door was really just so we could break into the events and it was, it was in the bigger picture so that we could break in and have professional surfing and have structured surfing out of, out of the rabble of whatever surfing was coming out of the, the whole summer of love thing and the, in the 72 world Congress in San Diego, I mean, in that one, it all imploded. And I, I actually, people will say, what was that like? And I, well, I'll tell you what it was like. It was like Woodstock meets Cheech and Chong. I mean, it was unbelievable <laughs> what was going on down there in ocean beach. So Hawaii became this, this amazing place. I mean, the whole Mahalo Bogues thing was really just a, a total tongue-in-cheek, you know, a tongue-in-cheek joke. I mean, it was nothing more than that. It was like I went over for a photo shoot in Surfing Magazine, and and they had it for me. I don't, you know, they actually had the robe and they did the photo shoot. I mean, what's amazing? I I felt a bit, you know, betrayed there because like they did the photo shoot, they called me the Surf Gorilla. Muhammad Bugs came down, all that, uh, and then when the when the proverbial shite hit the fan six months later, the same magazine went, "Rabbit's a monster and deserves everything he gets." Wow! <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it was like uh, this is because we were just over the top and trying to talk this sport up, um, and no one took anything seriously. No one took the sport seriously, and we we wanted to create a sport. And and we, we played it up for the media. And, yeah, I mean, it, it just it, it sort of went over the top, you know. Look, was, looking back looking back on that time, is there any um, learning lessons that you would tell yourself during then? Or, you know, that, yeah. is what it, what, that was what it was? And... Oh, no, there's one, there's, there's, one big room, there's one big lesson, and that would be uh, don't room with Ian Cairns. <laughs> That would be the biggest lesson by far. But you got to remember, like, Ian Cairns was Australia's best big wave rider. He came from Margaret River, you know, and he knew that I had a, I had this vision of me trying to crack it and have a go in Hawaii. Sunset Beach was really the, the proving grounds. And, and he was the best He was the best Australian surfer at Sunset Beach, like, by a long way. You know, he was really, really good out there. And he kind of took me under his wing. I mean, he, he showed me the ropes of Sunset, you know, no leg ropes, no leashes where the rips went, all that, you know, the west peak, the northwest peak, taking off behind it, the inside section on the north swell days, all that. And and so he was I, he was a bit of my, my mentor out there. But then it was him that did all the, all, you know, the, the interviews and, and all the, you know, the see, there's no real smoking gun with me. I mean, you can go back and archive everything that's ever been written about me, everything I've ever quoted, everything I've ever written, or every every interview I've ever said anything, and and I've never said a bad word about one human being ever. It's just not my style. But Ian was very kind of arrogant about it, you know. And and he said some big big statements, and I guess that mixed with a bit of Muhammad Bugs, you know, I became his kind of junior partner in crime, <laughs> and uh, and he got me in a lot of trouble. But um, you know, so that was the. the <laughs> I like it. I, I love no, it. I mean, I mean, your, I mean it's, 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 there's nothing more than that. I mean, we really actually, you know, I mean, seriously, I've got to tell you, when Jamie O'Brien won the Pipe Masters, 
there was a party at his place this was many, many decades later. And there's a bunch of guys sitting over there and, and a very super respected guy, Jim Sutar, came over and saw me. And he said, look, I've been talking amongst all these retired lifeguards. And he said, I just want to say to you, like, you know, kind of a, he sort of went, we know you, you actually didn't do anything. You know, you, we, it was all about slowing you down. And uh, so, you know, that was really nice to hear because I, I, I always felt that me personally, I, I never really felt like I did anything gnarly. I was just over the top with my media campaign, you know, and uh, the, the whole, uh, well, you know, I mean, I was cultivating an image, wasn't I? Uh, but it was just, it was just how it was. I mean, we, we you know, I, I do maintain though, I mean, like we weren't just surfing against surf champions. We were surfing against living gods. And there's a big difference there, you know, because living gods have disciples. And was, whereas, say, world cha whereas champions come and go. Like, put it this way, in the next generation come along with Tom Curran and Tom Carroll and Mark Ocalupo and Martin Potter and that. I mean, you know, I didn't have my guys going after them. Right. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's like, it was just a different era, you know? Sure. And you guys all, you started an era. I mean, over in Hawaii, God, watching the videos you have on your backside, on boards like that, no leashes. What was it like riding, you know, the pipeline, coming over from Kira? You had the skills, obviously, at tube riding. But then to go to a wave like that, was it challenging in the beginning? Because you left your mark there and, God, did extremely well. Well, I mean, it, it, look, it was beginning. It was incredible at the beginning and even harder at the end. <laughs> but, um, like, every time you go out of pipeline, you're putting it all on the line. And as I said, like, Sunset was more of the tr proving grounds because it's just such a big arena. And without leg ropes, I mean, I remember swimming out there one day. The sun was dropping in, and the sun was going down. And I was, I was way out behind Kemi Lance swimming with Terry Fitzgerald. And I just knew that, you know, I, could, I didn't seem like I was getting any closer to my surfboard. And I said to Fitzy, I went, look, I think I'm heading back, you know. And he turned around and said, no, it's too late. <laughs> like, you've got to keep swimming, man. You've got, you know, you, you've got to get your board now because we're way out to sea, you know. <laughs> you know, you had to know where on the west swells where your board went, on the north swells, you know, your board went into the channel. And, I mean, if you, say, went to the beach where well, your board was at Kemuland, but if you actually, if your board had gone to the beach and you went into the channel, well, you're going to Kemuland, you know. <laughs> it was gnarly. But yeah. pipeline was a pipeline was a whole different deal, man. Because uh, you know, it's the most yeah, it's just the most challenging wave in the world, you know. And it still is. I, I still think it's the, the most challenging wave in the world. It's it's just it's the pipeline, you know. And and you really got to want it. You've you've got to want it. You've got to you've got to you've got to want to go over that ledge, um, and, and you've got to want that wave. And you know, you've got to have everything going for you. You know, Sean Thompson and I made that pact where, you know, you've got to make the drop, you know, and um, on your back end, you've, you've really, you've got to make that take off on your back end. I mean, that's when you get really hurt, you know, if you don't make the drop on your back end because you don't penetrate. You sort of skitter along until the lip either gets you and you get, you know, driven into the reef or, you, you know, something bad's happening, right? So that was a that was a good pack to have, you know. Sean Sean and Mike Thompson were amazing out there. Michael Ho, you know, I mean, there were some great young guys that were charging pipe at the same time, and it was great to be amongst all that. Um, but pipeline, you know, I I, I surfed at I, I did about seventeen seasons at pipe, and and I finally really got to understand outside pipe and second reef pipe, and and that became where I you know really focused a lot of my energy, waiting for those days. And knowing, you know, knowing where to sit out there and, and you know, the, the bombs come through and, you know, you get cleaned up really quickly out there if you're in the wrong spot. And getting cleaned up out there is, it's not the same as on the ledger pipe. It's more like you're getting cleaned up by eight or, nine, eight or ten big rolling 20-foot whitewaters. And, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, as Derek Dorner said, you know, that's where you need absolute procedure on, on survival. You know, because everything's got to be done right. You've got to come up, get your breath, go under, you know, all that. And so that, that's a big challenge here. But the waves are big and blue and beautiful and you're isolated and you're out there by yourself. I mean, what's, there's nothing better than that. Did you have any wipeouts or a wipeout that still sticks out where you had to talk yourself back into wanting to paddle back out at that wave? Well, I, I, I had this, um, you know, yeah, I had some horrific wipeouts, um, you know, just pulling in back and just pulling into these, in the, you know, suddenly you're in this big black pit, you know, and you, you know you're not coming out. 
Um, you know, I, I, I only, I was pretty lucky at Pipe, really. I only broke my ribs there. That was the only thing I did. Uh, that was the, the one and only time I didn't make the draw. So the guy got in, t in, in front of me as I was paddling. I had to paddle around him and I should have pulled back, but I didn't have that momentum to get him out, me out of the ledge. But I, I did take a, a, a super bad one a, a, um, on a big, big day and, and everyone got cleaned up. And it was just Sean Thompson and myself out there. And this is well into the uh, 80s. This is more like about 88. And, and, and Sean and I were the only two that didn't get cleaned up by this huge set. And we paddled over this wave and the next one was just the most amazing wave of all times. And I, and I turned around and I went for it. And as I took off on the wave, I don't know what overcame me, but I went right. <laughs> <laughs> and Was and it I a was, right? I, no. Oh, it just, like when it's 15 feet, there's no rights. And, no. and it, was, it, it was this wave I decided to go right. And it was the most amazing sight I've ever seen in my life. The whole thing was pitching. I could see all the houses and everything. I mean, it was just, it was outrageous. I was on this Alan Byrne, seven foot ten, six, deep six channel bottom. And I'm, I'm, I'm pulled into this barrel and I realized the board, even this board, as, as good a board it was, this thing was too taut and too hollow and too gnarly for human consumption. And, and I decided I was going to make a run for it. Uh, as in like the board was skittering and, and the waves going and, and I suddenly got a bit frightened uh, that this might be the end. And so I decided I was going to run and I started running out of the barrel and, what? and the board, yeah, I went because there's whole momentum that there's, there's, there's so much momentum going that I, I was just going anyway. And, and of course, uh, you know, you're never going to run out of a barrel. Eh? So, <laughs> um the board came be from behind me, got me in the leg. That stopped my running momentum. And then I went up and over the falls and got pinned onto the bottom of backdoor pipe. And, and I thought, yeah, I thought that was going to be the one that did me in for sure. And Martin Potter saw it and Herbie Fletcher saw it and came down the beach. I, I actually literally crawled up the beach on my hands and knees and like I was done, right? It was like, you know, that Roberto Duran moment, you know, no mass, you know, no mass. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Potter said that was the best thing you'd ever seen, you know. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Where, where do you get the gusto? I mean, that, well, there's, there's these know. guys and then there's these guys. And, and well, you I don't have... know where you get it. Well, you know, I've got to tell you one thing. Uh, the gusto is gone. <laughs> okay. Okay. And fair enough. That's life, right? Yeah. I mean, like one thing that, you know, you, you, your courage in those situations, you know, just um, doesn't stay around forever, you know. Like, I mean, you just you just believe in yourself. You just believe that you're going to make it. You're going to survive it, you know. And, and you know, you've got to be ready for the worst scenario. I mean, that's why guys like uh, like Derek Dorna, I used to really, you know, or, and I still do, but I used to really look up to him and go, like, that's the guy, you know. And, and his, his philosophies were fantastic. And it was all about getting ready, being prepared for the worst scenario. Like Al Burns and I used to come to go to Hawaii and basically go for it on the, the first day that we were there, tr just try and take the worst wipe out we could. And because that was our, with. well, to get it done, you know, to yeah. get it over with, to get mentally ready because we, we didn't have that, we didn't have that four to six week uh, running that Al Chapman always said, you know, it takes six weeks to be North Shore ready, right? It's true. The fitness. So mentally, we try to get there in like uh, two days, you know. Uh, by going out at Wyomere Bay and just going reckless, backdoor pipe, all that sort of on a pipe day and and, and sunset on a gnarly day and, and just like taking some, you know, it's just taking some gas, you know, and and um, and then mentally you'll kind of go, well, it can't get worse than that, you know. <laughs> so 1978, you win a world championship. That little rabbit kid that was hustling the, the pinball machines wins a world championship. And, you know, when we speak about the, the mental aspect of this, at that point in time of your life, where were you? You know, what was, what did the straight ahead look like to you during that year? Well, I mean, I always, I always maintain that in, a, in an any, any era, like, um, you've got to be ready to walk in those shoes to be world champion. You've got to be ready to walk in those boots. And you know, you know when you are. I mean, I, I love being a contender, you know. Um, uh, 
I, I kind of maintain that even now, even even now or in any era you could look at, there's all you're only competing against four or five guys ever. Hmm. You know, you're, you're, there's four or five guys that you that can only ever win the world title in any given year in any given era, and they're the guys you're competing against. And and that's you know that's the being that's getting yourself into the point where you are a contender. You're per perennially in the top five, top three, top five in the world, and you've got a shot to be somewhere in the mix for the for the world title. I mean that's that's an exciting place to be, you know. And you and you you know you've got to be you've got to believe that you belong there. I got to speak with Jerry Lopez, and he got into yoga, and he was very yeah. into mind over matter. Were you doing anything during that time? Did training exist like it does now? Was was there cross training? Were you doing anything outside of your surfing to to prepare to try to win the world title? Yeah, I did. I I, I for years. I mean, from way back in the night. My my mother was a a, a ballet teacher. She hmm. actually taught classical ballet and then she taught jazz ballet. And I used to watch it. I I actually worked out my own little routine. I had my own little um, exercise routine. I did. I did it. I did it in the morning and I did it every night before I went to bed. And I, I did it for, year, you, know, t uh, you know, 10 years plus. What and was that it? Was, uh, well, you know, it's, it was, see, I've always, you know, she, she instilled in me one thing. And that is that surfing is a dance. And, and so I, my, my thing was more like a, an aerobic dance. Uh, and that was my, that was the training I did. It was more of an aerobic thing. And uh, it served me well, you know, and, and it, served, it really, I think it really served me well in small ways um, because, you know, I, I wasn't a natural in small ways, but with this aerobic program I did, you know, there's a lot of body movement. You've got to, in small ways, you've got to generate your own energy and you, you've got to generate your own speed. And I found that really helped me, you know, it's like I had to kind of work on my small wave surfing because even though the tour was, we had three or four events in Hawaii, we had events in South Africa and, and Burley and, and some really great places. We also went to Florida and, you know, there's some pretty small surf breaks and so Japan and you had to be, you had to be really good in, in, you know, basically you had to be good in two foot to 20, you know, because you'd be surfing two foot Japan, you'd be surfing 25 foot wide mirror. So it was, it was, you had to have it all, you know, but you know, I, I, I did a lot of stretching, you know, I, I was doing a lot of stretching and, um, you know, I, it's, it's that whole longevity thing. I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, that's why I, like I so admire guys like Jerry and that because he was doing it so, so far back and, and, and he's been such a great influence and, and really that, that whole longevity thing is really all about your suppleness and it really is about uh, that having that, that um, nervous twitch energy to be able to pop up and, 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 and you know, once we're up, we're fine. <laughs> it's like so, so, how, once so, you're up. So, so how important is routine and, and purpose and having your way uh, rather than following what works for somebody else? You found out your, your way during yeah yeah i did and, and uh, i mean I, I think that's really important because you know we can everyone has their vision i mean everyone has the people who influence them you know i mean my influence were you know were nat young and and, and peter Druin and you know reno abelera was a big influence on me I, I i just loved that way that guy surfed i loved the way peter Druin surfed and i loved the way uh, nat young surfed and i loved the way wayne lynch surfed they, they were massive, massive influences on me, and so I took a little bit of each one of them, you know. And, and but then you 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 make it, you build it into your own style, and you build it into your own approach. And and I I think that really is important, you know. And um, so that you're you you're, you're your own person, you're laying down your own tracks, and then as you as you sort of mature and you and you bring all those components together, then you can kind of be the best you can be. Awesome. Awesome. I love that stuff. See, that stuff gives me goosebumps, Rab. Unreal, Alex. Well, it's been cool, mate. I've been, I've really enjoyed having a chat with you. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Um, you are, you're who I dreamed of being as a kid. I was a little 10 year old kid that picked up a surfboard, was playing every sport and then surfing came over out of nowhere. It wasn't passed on. It, yeah. it happened through a junior lifeguard program we have here. And yeah. that first wave subconsciously took me 23 years later. And it's something that I can't live without. 
And, and I did want to be a professional surfer. And I ran into roadblocks, like people saying, it's not possible. You're taking yeah. the wrong path. You should do this. Yeah. What advice do you have uh, for the next generation? Because I know you've mentored Dean Morrison, Gary Elkerton. You went yeah. past serving yourself. You were the ASP president. You continued the journey to make it not only good for yourself, but better for the next generations to come. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I, I, look, I think we're in the age of anything goes, and, and like there's still opportunity there to, to make your own path. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, mentoring for a career in professional surfing is, you know, I'll, I'll help out anyone who wants to go on that path. There's so many other paths you can take too. I mean, we just had a thing over here called the Global Wave Conference, and it was there was 92 presentations. It was all before it was just all shut down. 92 presentations on on things on you know ocean sustainability and 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 people from all different walks of life and and people who have done PhDs and and you know university degrees and 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 studies on oceanography and and all and, and marine biology and marine science and um, you know. I, I just I loved every single bit of it, and I I really think that that is where the future is. I mean, I think for kids and that to to who really do care, they, this generation of kids come through, they really do care about our environment. They care about um, what's going to be left for them and 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 for their kids. And I I just really I really empathise and I really relate to those kids, and and I think they've got to be the leaders. I mean, I love the fact that they're calling they're calling these generations that they're calling us out, going you know what, you've, you've made a mess of this thing, you know? And and I think the opportunity is there and it's got to be there done in a way where you've actually qualified to be an expert on what you're talking about. And there's so many areas and so many different areas that, that you can combine surfing with and, and, and make a career out of and, and make an amazing life. I mean, I've always said to my kids, you know what, I just would, I just would like you to become accomplished surfers so that you can go, you become an accomplished surfer. You can go anywhere in the world and have adventures and have an incredible time and then combine that with something you love, something that you love doing. And then and you, and you combine the both and you've got a, you've got a career, you've got a lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I always saw the goodness in surfing, Alex, like, you know, back in the day, it was always like surfers were the bums and we were the, the, the dregs of society. And I went, hang on. This is, I, I see the same goodness now that I saw when I was 12. I don't see any difference. I only see the goodness. I see the light. And, and surfing's got so much to offer. And, you know, I think people, uh, the older generations in surfing, the elders, have really got to make sure that they are really kind of taking a leadership role here and guiding the, the young ones through and giving them hope. You know, I'm, I'm all about making sure they've got hope to fulfill their own dreams. Yes, I love it. Ravi, you are so cool. It's been just such a treat for me and I know everybody else. Thank you for your time. I hope you get to get a surf in today on that beautiful board behind you. And if I'm lucky enough, I'd love to share some ways with you. And you can be MR to me, okay? We'll switch roles. I'll be Ravi, you be MR, and you can burn me. Okay. Except I don't I have any world titles. Now, that's MP, that's MP that burned me. No. Uh, I thought you look, said MR was burning you too. No, he only burnt me in my dream. He only burnt my dream. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't a wave. <laughs> it was just the dream, not that big the of a dream. The dream, man. No, no. But um, look, Alex, like, I, you know, I just want to say hi to all my friends over in uh, California and America awesome. that have you know, locked down and, you know, thinking about you guys and all, all surfers all around the world in Hawaii and you know, I mean, we've been a bit lucky where we can we can still go out and go surfing. And uh, but like, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like on the other side of this. But one thing I think we are going to do is that I think we are going to just simplify things where we have more of an appreciation, just an appreciation of being able to go out, just an appreciation of being able to go to our local surf break and just an appreciation of, of what actually surfing is all about and, and, and what it is and the, and the, the joy and fulfillment is brought to our lives. And because it's such a family thing now. I mean, I, I went to a, a, the Canberra, which is the Washington, D.C. of Australia, and I said to all these federal ministers who were like the senators, I said, in the real world, mothers drive their children to the surf. It's a big statement because mothers don't take their children to something that's bad. Right. Cheers, mate.
I love it. Thanks for giving something for us to chew on. Say hi to your family, to your kids. And thanks for being you and everything you've done for surfing, for a kid like me who had a dream. It started with your generation and especially you as a very key figure in that. So again, thank you from all of us. Thanks, Alex. All the best, mate. 